Good morning. I'd like to welcome everybody here this morning to the Blue Earth County Board of Commissioners. And it's December 11th, 2018. Please rise and say pledge allegiance to the flag. <laughs> changes today. Motion approved. Second. All right, we got the motion for approval and a second. Is there anybody that would like to add or change anything else from the board side here? Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Hold the vote. Motion carries. Our first item of business looks like we have this morning. We have uh, public comment this morning. Uh, we've got a Mr. Larry Attenberger if you'd like to come up and to the podium over there and, and uh, share with us whatever's on your heart that's on your mind. Good morning, Larry. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning, sir. We've got uh, you know, our public comment periods usually aren't very long, so we no, try to keep it. It's fine. Okay. Um, I got a letter from the Soil Conservation Board of County that uh, my ditch on my property is cut by the county ditch and uh, it's private ditch as far as I know because they've never paid and I've got a map on here right from the courthouse here I don't know what floor the maps are in this courthouse anymore it was down basement but, and uh, because um, when the watershed took me to court um, Elvis Moore at that time he was here um, said there was a ditch across farm all his life and uh, there I would like to have you show it to me on this map where there's a ditch and uh, because I was fine but when they took me to court I already I was already fined for the ditch and um, so we'll see who, who can tell the truth and who tells a lie let's put it that way yeah. because uh, there's a quite a sum of bill out of this because the uh, ASC office says that, uh, that all these wetlands out there which were not wetlands um, before um, I could farm farm right through them and when I put the ditch in for my own use only and the watershed beef above they went lower that township covered that's illegal there's you know and I know I got pictures and I didn't bring them in today uh, what happened to that situation hey, could you hey, just for the record what's your what's your address then so I know I 12 8 I'm Larry after 12 8 17 
and uh, stay there around. Uh, and you was just lower that township power up there in the township right away. I got to <laughs> Is that, that, is that that field that used to flood all the time and they, they put a weeder in there, kind of like? Is that what you're talking about or not? Mm -hmm. Just north, just north of the weeder. Okay, no, okay. No, 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 I'm just curious. Yeah, no, I'm just curious. But, uh, and so uh, there's a fairly good sized sum of bail out here. According to what the, the extension service has figured out, $10.1 million today. Because I could be road propping that maybe every, every year. And, um, Next stop is from doing that. So okay, so it's a, it's a it's a it's a multiple of issues. It's the the ditch issue which you're claiming is private, and we've got it listed on our maps as yeah. public. And then that must be rated as a wetland out there. It's now. farmable wetland. A farmable wetland. You got to displace the wetlands the day we keep that ditch. Otherwise, it will be closed in. That's right from the ASC office. Those are the biggest things we got to figure out. So then, is there anything else? Well, about it. I know it's complex, but I'm just saying I know, know, I know. the basic thing. The basic but if you look at these maps, and, and you'll see, um, I, I dug the ditch in the fall of 87. In 87, I got marked that thumb. Because this map that I got right here is in 1987. Right, right. Okay, well, look, and, and sure everything be. before that was no ditch. Yeah. yeah. And so, Mayor Schwartz, he helped take the ditch out, and then he turned around, went under oath, and said it was a ditch farm all his life. So we got big yeah. time issues. Okay, so what I'll do is I took some good notes, and we'll make sure that we look at it again. And, look at uh, the map. Yep, and look at them and find out. It won't lie. I'm seeing that right out there. Yeah, and hopefully uh, you've connected with our ditch uh, staff, too. We've got two staff now that work with the ditches. I mean, do you think we connected with them? Well, I've talked to Craig Austin, and he won't hardly talk to you because he knows he's, it's wrong. He knows that already. Cause, okay. Cause, well, we'll connect <laughs> focus 
groups dealing with uh, specific stakeholders and a set of open houses that took place throughout the study process as well, whereby we either met in, uh, with each segment individually uh, and then in certain times when appropriate we brought all segments together and had one uh, open house for that particular, uh, for the study for all three segments. And as you can see uh, with the arrows through the middle, it just kind of gives you an overview of that study process from data collection excuse me, all the way through final report, soup to nuts, all the way through. In my presentation here, we'll step through each of those items. So with respect to corridor needs, uh, the first things that I'd like to provide an overview of, next slide please. Um, has to deal with a um, origin and destination study. We wanted to understand where people were going to and coming from with respect to the Trunk Highway 22 corridor because it allowed us to understand how is this corridor being used. And what we were able to determine as part of that analysis is that for the most part, with respect to segment two and segment three in a moment, that our key takeaway was is that the Highway 22 corridor is primarily used for locally based traffic, not necessarily pass-through traffic, meaning that they entered the corridor from somewhere external to St. Peter, and they exited the corridor somewhere external to Mapleton. That's what we considered a pass-through uh, trip. All other trips were either considered a local to regional, or regional to local, or local to local. So again, having that local characteristic to it. And why that's important is trying to understand how the corridor is servicing trips, either for mobility or access. So with respect to the next slide here in segment three, you can see that once again, those trips in segment three, understanding that the thumbnail here on the left side of the screen is a bit small, but the key takeaway again is that Highway 22 corridor primarily used for locally based traffic, not pass through. Now I will say that in this particular segment, you do see a bit more regional to regional traffic on the southern end of the corridor, but um, the majority of the traffic that still moves through this area on the south end of the corridor, that being in segment three, is still locally based traffic has a trip end beginning or ending somewhere along the corridor or immediately east or west of it. Do you know how they, how they determine that? Yeah, so this data is actually, we call it a, a big data for lack of a better term. We actually use GPS location data through cell phones. There's uh, the Minnesota Department of Transportation uh, held a contract and they've actually re-upped a contract with a uh, data service called Street Light Data. They receive the data and process it. It's nondescript data, so it doesn't say that Craig Vaughn was at this location on this day at this time, but it does, if I have my GPS notifier on, it does ping my phone and gives me a GPS location on that corridor at a specific time, doesn't tie it to me as Craig Vaughn. So it's general, that, general, data. general GPS data, locational based yeah. data. We can pull that and we looked at data over the course of about a year and a half or two years worth of data. It's millions of records and then we're able to process that information using software that we have available to us as well and then run different um, analytics on it. So it might not be as many people as we thought coming up from Iowa to do shopping. Exactly. Uh, yes. <laughs> they might be on 169. Well, there you go. Could be on 169. <laughs> Although that could very well be a regional to local trip phase, too, for some of those individuals yeah. that might very well be doing that. Not sure they're coming from Iowa. Next slide. Thank you. So with respect to corridor needs, continuing on. In segment two here, we looked at uh, safety well, with respect to the corridor as well. So from a safety perspective, we looked at crash rates. And we identified a number of intersections um, in, within segment two, as you can see here. Here's a list of ones that kind of rose to the surface. And we looked at what we call a crash rate being greater than a statewide average for similar intersections and crash rates that might otherwise surpass what we call a critical crash rate, which is a statistical significance calculation we run. And what you can see here is, is that there's a couple of county intersections that do rise above the statewide average for similar intersections. Cassad 2, Riverfront Drive at County Road 57, uh, North Victory Drive, uh, and a couple others here, Stadium Road, etc. But the ones that rise above the critical crash rate are the ones that are really ones that either have some type of geometric issue or some other um, concern that's causing us um, initial or even just more heightened awareness is that Augusta Drive and Bassett Drive. And so you'll hear some additional comments regarding those intersections later on in the presentation. Segment three also had the same thing run for it with respect to safety. And you see here that we have two of our county intersections at Casa 7 and Casa 29. I believe I can see that from here. I apologize. Mm -hmm. Highway 30, Casa 29. Above the statewide average. Uh, with respect to traffic forecast, so we also want to, this is a uh, long range plan. It looks out into the 2045 time horizon, if that's been something I know you've been working through your comprehensive planning process, whereby you're looking out in for future planning. We did look at traffic forecasts out into the 
the future in year 2030 and 2045. We leverage the previous uh, forecast developed as part of the Mankato North Mankato APO Long Range Transportation Plan, brought those up to speed with respect to today's conditions here in 2017 when the de numbers were uh, developed, and um, updated them based on study uh, technical advisory committee member input as well as current land use information or changes that we knew about at this point. Having that information then, we were able to uh, conduct operational uh, traffic operations analysis along the corridor as well through segment two and segment three. There's a number of key intersections that were reviewed, but we were able to identify a set of operations. Yes, I appreciate that if you wouldn't mind. Thank you. Yeah, that'll work. Okay. Okay. Um, so there's a number of intersections here that you'll see that do have some operational issues. And what we did here is, is we also outlined those operational issues by time frame, by either by year 2030 or by year 2045. So we can get a feel for, from an implementation perspective, if we do implement um, corridor improvements, at what time frame would those improvements be needed? And you can see here the North Riverfront Drive, um, Augusta Drive, North Victory Drive, um, Adams Street, I believe, and Madison Avenue are projected to have operational issues by year 2030. Uh, a couple of intersections, Bassett Drive, uh, oh, so there's only one intersection, rather, Bassett Drive is anticipated to have a approaching capacity issue by year 2045. So what you can see here is, is within the next 10 plus years or so, we're going to start to see operational issues along this corridor as it exists today, right, with our current um, configuration of this corridor. So then also another uh, key input that we took into account is the pavement condition and understanding that the Minnesota Department of Transportation has predicted the pavement along this corridor to project it in poor condition in some locations by year 2026. The next slide for segment two here then also understands once again from a traffic forecast perspective, um, the same process was followed whereby traffic forecasts are projected to be about 2,400 to 4,000 vehicles um, throughout Mapleton by year 2045. And then no operational issues though in the Mapleton area were identified, but I'll, I'll also reference back to that as part of my comments under future recommendations. Continue on with the corridor needs perspective, we also wanted to review and understand how pedestrians and bicyclists might use this corridor. Now we, we understand this corridor is a highly vehicular corridor, right? But there's also some adjacent land uses that also either are apartment buildings or higher density residential and a school right there by the Prairie Winds um, south, of Fort, uh, south of Madison there. And so we wanted to identify trail gaps. We identified a trail gap between Hoffman Road and County Road 90 um, um, through that segment two. And we also identified the need for improved pedestrian crossings to cross Highway 22 so it doesn't try to minimize the barrier that Highway 22 is to pedestrian and bicycle activity. Okay, uh, next slide. I think actually, I apologize. The previous slide one. The last comment I think I, um, I, I missed here was, is also taking into account and throughout Mapleton too, uh, the, the need for multi-use trail in that community. There isn't much trail accommodation or sidewalk along the 22 corridor, but yet uh, the corridor bisects uh, the, uh, the sports facilities or ball fields, the, the football stadium versus from where the high school is. And so we wanted to understand how people get across that road as well. Thank you. So from a corridor vision perspective then, having that be kind of our foundational elements of the study, having all that understanding of issues and needs, we took a look and said before we got into alternatives development, working with our technical advisory committee, we rolled our shirt sleeves up and we said, all right, we've received information from the public up to this point. We have an understanding of the corridor issues and needs. What do we see as being the vision for these roadways, um, for this roadway out into the future? Segment two was broken down into a couple of different segments, because once again, in the context in segment two is a bit different as you come in from the north heading south um, as you're approaching from uh, County Road 2 up to Riverfront Drive there it's a bit different than as you go from Riverfront Drive even further south to where the health facility is coming into Trunk Highway 14 etc so that's uh, the northern end and the southern end are considered segment 2a in segment 2a from County Road 2 to County Road 26 
and from Highway 23 uh, Stadium Road down to County Road 90, uh, Highway 83 rather. We want to emphasize multimodal connectivity and we envision a two-lane or four-lane type roadway um, transitioning from a four-lane to a two-lane, um, urbanizing roadway with a speed limit of about 45 to 55 miles an hour. We understand we want to manage direct access to the corridor and keep in mind the corridor aesthetics, how the roadway looks and feels. And remember too, these visions were developed before we ever got into alternatives analysis. Next slide. So in segment 2B, that central portion of segment 2, right there through, uh, I'll just say around the, the, the Highway 14 area and through a lot of the um, commercial area there, we want to emphasize again multimodal connectivity. We envision a mostly four-lane urbanizing and maybe a parkway roadway uh, with a speed limit of 45 to 55 miles an hour with limited direct access to the corridor. And once again, understanding and keeping in mind the corridor aesthetics, how the roadway looks and feels to folk people who use it or gain access to it. Down in segment three to the Mapleton area, we want to again emphasize that multimodal connectivity or accommodation on either side of the roadway, kind of bridging that gap and uh, um, certain, uh, minimizing the barrier. We really were envisioning at the time a two lane or three lane roadway accommodating some type of turn lane um, to give people better access onto and off of the 22 roadway. Keep in mind how the roadway looks and want to balance between that vehicular mobility and the accessibility along the court, people that be being able to get onto and off the roadway. So an alternative then, we got into an alternative development process. So as part of this, we took feedback from the general public at large, also looking at all the technical information that we have reviewed up to this point. And in that segment 2A, the northern piece and the southern piece here, uh, we took into account looking at uh, potential two-lane roadway, one lane in each direction, with and without a trail. We looked at potentially a three-lane roadway, some accommodation for Dutch center uh, two-way left turn lane, again, with and without a trail. And then we also looked at it and said, well, through these areas where it's mostly two-lane today, how you know how would it look or how would it what would the impacts be if we had a four-lane roadway or you know added additional capacity or two lanes in each direction? In segment two B, we took a look at it and said, okay, we need a we need a fair amount of roadway here. We still need the four lanes that are out there today, two lanes in each direction. But if you remember, we talked about maybe looking at more of an urbanizing or parkway type roadway. So today it's a, what we call a rural roadway with ditches on either side and center uh, kind of grass ditch in the middle. But what if we looked at it as an urban roadway with curb and gutter, <coughs> maybe a little bit more street trees or you know, pedestrian scale lighting on the other side of the roadway, the city of Mankato. Uh, thought that could be very important to them to kind of change the character of the roadway through that piece. And so we looked at a urban facility or a rural facility four lane through there as well with trail accommodations on either side. Is that from Mankato to 90? That uh, piece right there is from County Road 26, so by the health facility on the north down to Stadium Road. Mm -hmm. Okay, just right around um, 83, Highway 83. Oh, and then from 80 to Mankato proper within city limits effectively. Yeah, I guess. yeah, yeah effectively. Correct. And then from 83, the majority of which would be mostly just outside Mankato proper and kind of more, I would say, maybe the county's consideration versus cities and not saying that one jurisdiction has uh, more interest than the other. From there down to 90 would be that part of that uh, segment 2A that I referenced. Right. And I'll, and I'll be sure to highlight that again when I get to our recommendations. What I'm saying is you, you were recommending curb and gutter up no. to 90. No, correct. That's from um, from the health facility at County Road 26 yeah. down to the city. Three. Just through the city yeah. itself, correct. So from an intersection alternative perspective, this is a piece that's pretty interesting to most. Uh, we looked at four different kinds of corridor intersection alternatives. We want to understand how should the corridor access points be uh, managed throughout the um, segment two and segment three, also in segment one, but we're not talking about segment one today. Uh, we looked at traffic signals um, as a whole, roundabouts as a whole, uh, roundabouts with meters or some type of signalization of a roundabout potentially out into the future, depending on how it might um, how it might be functioning, or a hybrid corridor alternative, traffic signals, some roundabouts, maybe looking at a reduced conflict intersection that had been something that had been talked about um, in the past at the Augusta Drive intersection of 22. Uh, so we also reviewed that as well, understanding how those might function out into the future. In segment three, that's all segment two. So in segment three, from an alternative perspective, uh, we took a look at a 
two-lane rural road, which is out there today, with and without a trail, so a do-nothing versus adding a trail on the west side of the road. Uh, potentially looking at a two-lane urban facility, again, curb and gutter, uh, versus a um, three-lane facility of a rural nature, and then also looking at a three-lane um, urban section out there, too, with a trail to try and understand what would the impacts be of those different roadway cross-sections through that community. Is this going through Mapleton? It's hard. Yes. On both sides of Mapleton, I mean, that's... Yes, so Chair, uh, members of the board, so this, uh, if you actually scroll back, just give me a right through that area. So these sections right here, the limits of this would be, from the most part, the, the north, again, along Trunk Highway 22, along the 22 corridor, from the northern uh, part of the city limits, for the most part, down through, I believe it's uh, Highway 30, County Road 29 on the southern end. So our recommendations here, we did also uh, made a couple of different recommendations from, with respect to what type of roadway section would be proposed through there. So for the most part, as you come in and you see the Welcome to Mapleton sign right there by the Casey's gas station on the north end um, through town as you, as you go through Mapleton. Okay. Thank you. We evaluated these alternatives too to understand, okay, well, um, how do they kind of merit out? How do they, how do they rank for the most part? We looked at a preliminary evaluation to kind of screen through, um, you know, we had eight to 12 alternatives prior to getting down to the ones that I just went through with you. We presented a lot of information to the general public as well to get their feedback. Um, we refined our alternatives based on that feedback and then we conducted a more um, definitive evaluation of the refined alternatives was completed. The next slide here gives you a feel for just at an arm's length, so to speak, um, how we reviewed the corridor alternatives. If you take a peek at that on the screen, across the top there, you'll see evaluation criteria with respect to uh, how the corridor functions, uh, right-of-way considerations, safety perspective as well, how the corridor, maybe these changes might affect uh, safety or not. Um, the public opinion is a column here as well, the public feedback that was received and then a cost consideration too uh, coming into, um, into play. And then we, have, we applied a color scheme, as you can imagine, red being um, further down on the color scheme and that blue and green being further up on the positive side of that color scheme. And then based on this evaluation, we were able to understand um, not solely just the evaluation, but it really did give us a good feel for maybe which corridor alternative best suited each segment that I just uh, presented to you. We also conducted intersection control evaluation reports. Remember I had all those traffic, uh, the intersection operations that I presented, so those ICE reports were conducted. Um, we identified, and they, those were conducted in segment two at um, County Road 57, um, County Road 3, and then 227th or County Road 26th and Bassett Drive. Uh, no change in rural or urban section travel time was identified. We wanted to take a look at, well, if you took, if you modified these intersections where there aren't traffic signals or roundabouts today, how would that impact your travel time along the corridor, right? Truly just north-south. So from a travel time perspective, we looked at, okay, if you were to travel all the way through, not getting onto or off of, how would the travel time be affected? And what we de uh, determined is that while there is a difference uh, between if you have all traffic signals or all roundabouts or roundabouts with meters, the difference isn't as significant as one might think. Now I will offer that the southbound travel time of a, your current condition, if you did made no changes, would be 7.8 minutes. And again, that's just traveling through the corridor. That's not getting onto or off of the corridor. And the travel time under the future condition, uh, comparable between traffic signals, roundabouts, and meters varies from 10.5 to 8.9 to 10.8. It's a difference, but it's not necessarily an extremely tangible difference for that travel time throughput. The one thing to note is, is that if you do not do any type of um, traffic signal roundabout or otherwise some kind of traffic control at many of these intersections, you will not be able to get onto the corridor. So you can travel through it, but you won't be able to access it. And if you remember my origin destination comment early on, the majority of the traffic using the corridor wants to tr use the corridor, get off of it, and then get back onto it. So that wasn't quite serving our purposes, which indicates to us that we need some type of future traffic control at some of these intersections, whereby you'll see with my recommendations here in a moment. <coughs> Thanks for bearing with me through that long explanation. <laughs> um, once again, evaluation of alternatives now in segment three. I'll go pretty quick because I gave you an overview of the um, evaluation process. We did evaluate segment three as well. Um, and looking at those alternatives.
the uh, yes, the intersection of Kyner Road 57. Yes. Yeah. Um, on the previous slide, if you don't mind scrolling up for me, from uh, which perspective, Jerry? Well, I'm just refresh my memory where it is. Is there another name for that road? Or is it yeah. So Kyner Road 57 uh, is North Riverfront Drive. So it's yeah. the it's okay. the kind of Lime Valley kind of yeah, runs by our mall trailer park. Yeah. Yeah. Out by I believe it's Contractor oh. Edge. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Shop yeah. House. The well, the the intersection right there. Yeah. Right. And we'll we'll get into the uh, intersect proposed intersection treatment here. That's like well. That's the worst one as far as I'm concerned. Through intersection It's just a with a driveway on the right end or eastern side of the driveway. Correct. Sure. Chair and members of the board, I'll be sure to pause on that to Ryan's point. Thank you, Ryan, for pointing that out too. I'll be sure to pause on that one when we get to our recommendations, which is probably maybe the more um, interesting portion of my presentation. <laughs> but I think it's all interesting. It's yeah. all <laughs> Thank you. All right, so with respect to evaluation of segment three, once again, arm's length test, looking at the colors, you can kind of get a feel for the same evaluation criteria and how the various alternatives that uh, no build, two lane, and three lane alternatives were, were viewed uh, with respect to this corridor or with this segment within the corridor as well. So now to the recommendations. So uh, with what has been recommended as part of the study is um, a set of things with respect to the roadway, how the roadway uh, should be designed. So we, we, we make a recommendation there. We make a recommendation for the trail component adjacent or alongside the roadway. And then we make a recommendation for the intersections. I'll first start with the roadway considerations. So recommended alternatives within segment two, I'll work from south to north. I just happen to have my slides oriented this way. So uh, we are recommending resurfacing or reconstructing, depending on what's determined at the time of preliminary design, of the 22 corridor from Stadium Road down to County Road 90, so that, that southern segment of segment two, um, as a two-lane roadway, okay, two-lane rural roadway, one lane in each direction, and a trail on the west side, which I'll comment on here in a moment, um, kind of accommodates that trail gap that I mentioned for you between Hoffman and County Road 90 on the south side through the central portion of the community there in Mankato on 22. We recommend resurfacing or reconstructing Highway 22 from that County Road 57 intersection on the north end uh, to Stadium Road or County Road 83, County Road 60 um, on the south end of this, this uh, sub-segment here. Now the one thing that's interesting is, is at this point we're leaving it open for continual discussion amongst uh, the partners here, the study partners, that being the city, county, and state of whether or not this should be reconstructed or resurfaced as a rural facility, which is what it currently is today, um, or as an urban roadway with curb and gutter um, and the more parkway type feel. As you can imagine, there's a significant cost difference between the two, depending on what treatment or improvement is um, implemented here. And so there's going to need to be some additional discussion amongst the jurisdictional partners uh, through this area. Uh, for the area through um, uh, the northern piece of segment two, we are recommending widening the roadway of Highway 22 from County Road 2 to the North Riverfront, which is on the northern end, which is the Lesseur Blue Earth County line, um, down to County Road 57 to a three-lane roadway. So now we're providing some more consistent uh, current lane accommodations off of the 22 corridor, and maybe not so much of providing passing, but that you don't have to stay behind a vehicle or try to use a, a, a bypass lane. Uh, to get around. There is a thumbnail sketch here of the um, concept uh, sketch design on the right side that gives you a feel for what a three-lane roadway would look like through that area. The green there, just, uh, just for um, background, isn't necessarily our, our right-of-way limits, but it is our construction limits, so area of roadway adjacent to the, uh, the road that might be impacted by construction. Commissioner, did you have a comment? What's the mileage between uh, that point and where it starts to be a four-lane? Is that approximately, I would say that's probably just over a mile, probably about a mile and a half, a mile, mile and a half. So you're talking about a mile and a half of widening the road. Oh, three lane, correct. Oh, actually, now that I take it back, I apologize. Uh, between where the, yeah, that's, that's probably, that could be maybe two miles. Maybe a mile and a half to two miles. Except that it, yes. it does, the, the road does widen before it gets to the uh, four lane already. Correct, it does. For a point. It does. Coming south from St. Peter. So, uh, you know, that'd be, it'd be interesting to see what that costs and what, what the issues are, you know, there. But thank you. So, so you're saying, you know, 
Can I just ask a quick question about this? Or should I wait? Oh, feel free. Okay, okay. Gerald. You're saying that three lane recommendation is all the way from County Road 2. Correct. Which was across a bridge. Correct. So would the bridge be changed? Yeah, I, if I remember correctly, that bridge. Yeah, if I remember correctly, that bridge should be in, in order for replacement or. Oh, it is. Okay. It's, it's already in line. It's in its lifespan, uh, kind of in timing with this project. So there's, yeah, that bridge goes over the trail. The, Scotta Trail. Scotta Trail. It, yeah, it, and it may have adequate width to fit. I, I don't recall off the top of my head. Yeah, I believe in the mid 10 year capital highway improvement pro, uh, plan or program kind of bridge is slated for improvement. Um, yep. But at the same rate, if I, if I try to answer that question as well as the previous commissioner's question, uh, chair, members of the board, uh, we do have the costs broken down um, with that level of granularity. I do not have that information in front of me, but I can provide that information as a supplement uh, to the board if you'd like to I see where the road goes over at that location, though, it's still fairly wide. It is mm -hmm. farther to the north where it would have to be widened and converted to from two lane to three lane. Uh -huh. I don't believe that's a concern. I think of the rail bridge versus the Scotta Trail bridge. Correct. I think right. that's right. right. the Scotta Trail bridge. The Scotta Trail bridge. There are two yeah. bridges. I would think of the rail bridge. Correct. I apologize. So we have two bridges in that corridor. Okay. okay. Correct. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Now, in uh, okay, so this is actually this is an additional slide that needed to be deleted. I apologize. Please advance next slide. So, in segment three, in segment three, now the recommendations from a roadway perspective would be to widen Highway 22 through Mapleton uh, with a three-lane roadway. It's currently two-lane in each direction and a trail on one side, the west side. And we are proposing that as an urban section to accommodate pulling that trail in closer to the roadway so to, uh, to minimize our impacts to the private property on the west side of the road. So that would be a fairly significant change through that area as well. And I'll comment on the implementation slide um, regarding how um, how it's thought, how soon these types of things and where the priority lies for each. The next couple of slides, oh, and then on the southern portion, kind of once again, uh, to the commissioner's question earlier about the limits of the Mapleton area, that was on the northern section of the Mapleton um, corridor, so mostly right there through town. There is a piece of the 22 corridor that was within our study limits that looked a little further south a bit after you get um, out of town. So we are recommending to resurface and reconstruct Highway 22 from the southern portion of the Maple, uh, Mapleton city limits to Highway 30 Cassaw, or County Road 29 as a two-lane rural roadway, so continuing to maintain its current configuration, but not that three-lane with the trail. Um, that's not necessary at that additional cost. Now here's another key point from an intersection perspective. All of the that was all roadway stuff, so I'll hit on the intersection ones, and I might start to uh, pick up my pace once again to be respectful of everyone's time. From an intersection perspective, we are recommending for the most part this corridor as what we would call a roundabout corridor. Um, uh, the intersection. That's an yeah. understatement. At least County Road 17 won't have the most roundabouts anymore. <laughs> uh, the recommendation would be to manage these intersections with roundabouts. We did review as previously mentioned traffic signals, roundabouts, or otherwise, and um, it is recommended to take a look at these as a roundabout. So from um, that County Road 57 intersection, North River Front Drive on the north end through uh, Stadium Road or Highway 83 on the south end, uh, that would be uh, County Road 57, County Road 26, there at the um, medical facility, Augusta Drive, North Victory Drive, County Road 3, Bass Drive, and Hoffman Road, those would all become roundabouts. Um, in theory, and again, at different uh, time scales and implementation measures as needed, but roundabouts nonetheless. The intersections at the um, Trunk Highway 14 or Highway 14 ramps, those would remain signals. Uh, they were reviewed for potential roundabouts, but the functionality of those as roundabouts um, didn't work out due to their how closely spaced they are to one another without reconstructing that intersection. And in fact, it has significantly more. Yeah, excuse my interruption, Craig. But, uh, the intersection with County State Highway 57, we, we also in the report have consideration of the continuous T intersection, I believe. And I don't know if we have a graphic in here, but we're looking at that as an alternative to a roundabout, uh, depending on future considerations. So we are looking at uh, different alternatives for treatment of that intersection if perhaps a roundabout is not the, the best solution. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Ryan. Um, Chair, members of the board, I do believe I, I, um, I might, I think, actually, would you mind advancing three slides? Okay. 
Uh, you can go back up those three. So that slide, Ryan, was removed. Don't okay, request the city of Mankato. I apologize, but uh, so this this presentation does not include that slide. But if you'd like, I can speak about the um, continuous T a little bit further for you to give you kind of a feel, uh, chair, what that is. So I'll explain that a little bit. Yeah, yeah, I can get it to them after the fact as well if uh, yeah, yeah, so additional interest in it. So a continuous T is, is for the most part, as Ryan explained that intersection earlier. North Riverfront Drive, Conroe 57, is the left side, the west side of that intersection. So as you're passing north south through there, it kind of branches off to the to the left side, the west side there, right? And the majority of the traffic is coming south and taking a right and going down 57 or coming straight through. The rest of the traffic is either coming off of 57 and making a left to go north or coming north on 22 and continuing north, right? So it's it's got a kind of an off skew at that intersection. We could do a little bit of realignment, which we are proposing and recommending as part of reconstructing that intersection. But what a continuous T is, is it tries to um, reduce the amount of conflict at the intersection. So right now, a vehicle that wants to make a left-hand turn off of Riverfront Drive or 57 onto 22, they have to look for a gap in the southbound traffic, identify if they're making a southbound right or a southbound through, which can be a little tricky. They also then have to look to their right side, their right, to the, to the south for a northbound car coming and wait for a gap in that northbound through or northbound left. What a continuous T will do is, is it will remove the conflict of the northbound traffic for the most part. So you mostly have to look at only the southbound traffic because you'll put a barrier between the vehicles turning left onto 22 to go north and the vehicles heading northbound through. There's actually a, either a raised median or a vertical kind of jersey barrier that oftentimes is placed to separate those two. So as the vehicles turn left, they both can proceed in together and then merge on in a little further north of the intersection. Hence, so you the that continuous T nature. Okay, so you get that T, you can go across the southbound lane and go left on 22 or take a right. On Somewhat of like a, almost maybe considered a little bit of an excel, a separated acceleration right. lane where almost, they yeah. merge after the fact. Sure. So they only have to make a decision about crossing yeah. one lane of traffic versus two. There's a median in the middle that they can stop at, like yeah. Casey's intersection. Uh, they, would not, they would not no, stop. Oh, just having a just having they, they just wouldn't have to conflict with the northbound traffic. Right. They'd only so have they to cross the southbound yeah, lane and they'd be able to accelerate and then merge with the northbound traffic. That would help that intersection uh, tremendously. I the only thing the there is that for sure is that nobody would be able to take a left going north. You would have, there are two things, uh, Chair, uh, members of the board, two things that would need to be under consideration. That's why this is an either or. Yeah. There's also another conflict um, here as well, or consideration rather, not conflict, but there is a west leg here for a driveway. You would need to look at the northbound left and the west leg as a driveway, and I try to understand how, how would the design accommodate each of those two things. So you are correct. The northbound left, it could still be implemented that the northbound left would be allowed, um, and then the traffic making that left turn off of 57 onto 22 would have to look at southbound and northbound lefts. But northbound lefts, for the most part, the traffic volume associated with that northbound left is relatively small. Um, so again, you, you significantly re reduce yeah. your conflicts at the intersection. But we still have, we do still have a significant um, consideration of the driveway on the west, on the east side of the roadway, which is, uh, I don't want to minimize that by increase. Mm -hmm. That would require like And you're going into realignment of that driveway. Possible sure. three lane. Uh, so in this location here, if you do recall, uh, Commissioner, uh, Chair, um, there is a recommendation for a three-lane roadway north right. of here. So you would need to design that section of the three-lane to occur a bit further north of this as well. So there's there's design considerations, but it can be done. But yeah. you could you could with that three-lane you could make that left-hand turn, you know, coming okay. from coming from uh, Riverfront Drive, take a left-hand turn and go towards St. Peter. Mm -hmm. You could have them go into that third, that center lane as a speed up and then enter into the uh, um, the lane of traffic further, you know, north. You have approximately the very similar I mean, I, footprint. I went and saying, pulled yeah. up a yeah. continuous T on, on the intersect, you know, you know, but that's for a four lane. That's correct. Okay, that that would be different than a th what a three lane would look like. Chair, members of the, um, uh, members of the board, as the commissioner is referencing here, actually, uh, uh, not a good example, but a similar example. This isn't a continuous T, but just referencing the left turn and the acceleration.
separation that he's talking about before you zipper together or merge into the other lane. It's kind of what was similarly just done at the 14-169 interchange. Again, similar concept, but different in how it totally functions. But as you're coming off of that um, eastbound ramp off of 14 onto 169, you make that left, you know how they, they've really combined a lot of things in there, but it does help for that left turn being able to merge and accelerate with the left to go on to 14. So there's a lot of extra conflicts going there, but the concept is similar in that you're provided an acceleration lane, and so the way in which it would be designed, if I get a little bit into the detail, if you're hearing me for a moment, is you would actually proceed into what would be a dedicated acceleration lane. You'd merge into the other northbound through lane, as you mentioned, and then north of there, you would want a defined branching back out into that left turn lane, that right. center left when, turn lane. When it's safe. Correct. Contextually, Correct. I'd almost equate it to what was done by Casey's in Eagle Lake on Highway 14 in our county state of Highway yeah. 6. Mm -hmm. It is somewhat similar nature where we had had a, uh, uh, an acceleration lane during the construction project on the interchange with CASA 12. Uh, and then later, MnDOT actually ended up adding that in with the uh, R cut. So it's kind of similar concept mm -hmm. there as far as functionality, not necessarily uh, geometrically. So, so I appreciate you covering that, Craig. That's, uh, that was good to bring that up. That was good. Thank you. I know the one thing for sure was that that intersection is really in need of changing. Uh, the road has a slight bend right after that. And also, it goes from the four lane into the two lane. There's a lot going on there. So a lot going on there right now, even. So anything that we can do to improve that, make that intersection safer. Well, the, the private drives in for 57. You need a car that has good acceleration speed. <laughs> <laughs> like our electric cars. No. <laughs> So I'll breeze through these fairly quickly. These were all mostly covered. I just separated them out to give the proper consideration to the multimodal accommodations. Again, a trail on the west side of the road from Hoffman to County Road 90 in the southern segment of segment two. Next slide. And then those trail crossings, you'll remember that we have wanted to identify bridging or not necessarily for lack of a better term, I use that as a, just a figure of speech, but as it turns out, uh, two bridges were recommended for pedestrian crossings of the 22 corridor as well. So constructing a pedestrian overpass near the Prairie Winds Middle School, middle school and the uh, second pedestrian uh, overpass would be recommended to construct a pedestrian overpass between North Victory Drive, County Road 3, and Augusta Drive uh, due to some of the land use development that's occurring there just north of the Menards is roughly. And again, these are just as, uh, concept sketches. This is not an exact location. This is not the exact design. These are just provided for reference as they move toward preliminary design. Uh, through the Mapleton area, from a multimodal perspective, as I mentioned, this gives you kind of a plan view, bird's eye view, looking down how that uh, roadway or how the impacts would for that three lane with the trail on the west side of the road. You can get a feel for how that trail uh, would be accommodated there with the driveways. It is tucked up closer to the road. Uh, we are having some. Um, interim construction impacts there with the green, but as you can see, the roadway stays within the right way. The roadway and trail stays within the right way. So from an implementation plan perspective, we did outline a, a phasing sequence of priority using um, short term, which is kind of a high medium priority, a long term, which is a medium to low priority, and then an opportunity driven, which is pretty low priority, but you know, if opportunity um, um, kind of pops up, look for implementing these types of improvements as well. Some of the outcomes, I very just tried to put this in a few bullets here. Uh, the corridor improvements, the implementation phasing is still being finalized. And at the, the time of this, it was that we have since uh, submitted that to the Department of Transportation as well as the MAPO. It will be coming out uh, to the rest of the partners here, I believe, following tomorrow. Uh, that will be sent to the rest of you for a final review. Uh, the pedestrian improvements are all mostly opportunity driven, so those trails adjacent to the road, you know, build those as um, roadway projects. Are, um, are, are proposed or planned, uh, make those opportunity driven. Our short-term high priority intersections are, as you uh, commissioners just commented, that at 57 Riverfront Drive there, that's a high priority um, short-term improvement recommendation. Augusta Drive and Bassett Drive are also short-term <coughs> for safety intersections. Those are intersections at critical safety issues. And then also from a short-term, maybe medium priority um, intersection, a 
be at North Victory Drive at County Road 3, and then also at Hoffman Road, um, implementation of those roundabouts at those locations as well. Therefore, with our next steps are to final our project wrap up here and, and throughout this month of December, and this was my last presentation on the Trunk Highway 22 Roadshow. That's why you're so good at it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so how many have you done? Uh, this, uh, Chair, members of the board, this is Presentation. Yeah, thank you very much. And, and all these make absolute good sense. I mean, all it takes is money. Yes, sir. You know, and uh, I mean, uh, it was. Uh, I think there was quite a few of us that were when Prairie Winds was was being built. We're saying, but you're going to need a, you know, something to go over the road there. Potentially. And yeah. uh, sure enough, a few years later, that's that's what came out. You know, yeah, we need we need a. A bridge to go across 22. Could I ask about that too? Uh, Commissioner is going to ask about you know, the, how they looked at those roundabouts are recommending and with or without a pedestrian bridge. So, what would the recommendation be? You know, if for sure there's no pedestrian bridge, would they still recommend, regardless, um, having a roundabout with all of the people that might be using it? for walking and for bicycles. Mm -hmm. uh, Chair, members of the board, so the roundabouts would still have at grade or you know level right there, pedestrian accommodations. You'd still have your Americans with Disability Act pet ramps. You'd still be able to cross the intersections at those locations. You hopefully would have something to receive them, the trails on either side of the road, which there's currently a trail on the east side of the road. Um, I believe there is a trail, um, uh, there's, some, there's some adjacent trail there. Uh, heading to the west as well, uh, that you'd still be able to do that with or without the pedestrian overpass. And each intersection that was uh, modified or reconstructed as a roundabout would have that accommodation. There's been a fair amount of discussion as to whether or not the pedestrian should be accommodated right within the circle as it currently is today, and there's a fair amount of research that some are recommending maybe that should be moved a little bit further away from the intersection so that people can handle the vehicular conflicts that are happening in a roundabout, get out of the roundabout, and then look for pedestrian conflicts. Um, there's yeah. some of that that's still being reviewed, but nonetheless, um, all pedestrians would still be accommodated at those intersections as well. And then the recommended speeds you had, um, maybe I misunderstood it, but was it 45 to 55 miles an hour through the city corridor? So our recommendation was for, as part of the visions, were to um, look at 45 to 55 miles an hour. Currently we are, and the speed limits um, are not being recommended to change through any segments of the corridor. So we are maintaining the current speed limits that are out there as we get to preliminary design. Uh, the, the design speed that the roadway is designed with uh, will be determined at that time. But it would range between that 45 to 55 miles an hour as appropriate for the current speed of it. Interesting. Yeah. yeah. That's interesting. I have um, the interchange of Bassett Drive and 22. Is there a reason that we don't have a yellow flashing light on that for a left hand turn? I'm not, I'm not certain that's why that's the city in case you need uh, because so many, so many of the other inter interchanges, the state made this change to have the yellow. I could follow up with MnDOT's traffic engineer and inquire as to why that one doesn't have the flashing yellow arrows. So, so many times it, it, it would be really useful. I mean, not. No, no, no. So, so it might mind. save me 30 seconds. You know, I don't know why, but uh, but I'm. The only, my only question is why not there when it's in so many other places? Understood. And uh, so if, if you could ask that, that question, that'd be great. Will do. Out of curiosity, if you don't mind me asking, Chair, members of the board, Commissioner, is that with respect to on 22 or on, on 22? Trees? On 22, I'm just for like taking the left hand, like if you're northbound going or, uh, northbound or southbound. Right. I I notice it more uh, southbound because I I uh, live up in that area and I come south and then I take a left hand turn and either go to Lowe's or Coles or something like that, and I notice that there's no yellow flashing light. You know, it turns red mm -hmm. and 
and I'm going, well, why, why isn't it, you know, because that's a warning type light. You, you, you know, it's kind of yeah, like. I'm not you, certain the specific reason. I know I've heard concern expressed about the flashing yellows that now people are uh, effectively treating them as a green arrow and uh, making some dangerous movements. So there may be some concern in that regard. But I'll yeah, but you're going to see that. We've seen that with yield signs oh, for years. Absolutely. I'll, I'll, I'll look into it with MnDOT and follow up with you. One person with yield is not the same. Yeah. yeah, I don't like those flashing turn signal lights. I just, yeah, I just don't know why. It's a deal. Yeah, I can. Know, but a solid yellow, you yeah. still have right away, right? Solid yellow, you have right away. Flashing yeah. yellow, you don't have right away. Well, yeah, you no. have. You can. Solid yellow, you don't have right away yeah. either. If there's something yeah. if yellow, if yellow, you don't have caution. If I, if, if, if it, for the just to humor the board, uh, chair members of the board, if yeah, I humor, offer, if humorous. I offer us. Well, if I offer an opinion, I hate we to We always the, love humor on this board <laughs> anyway. If I, so. I hate to speak for the DOT, but I did ask Ryan. Because I'll just offer a comment. As a, as a traffic operations engineer, I'm a PTOE as well. Um, so I, I'll put on a different hat here. In many instances, depending on flashing, where to place flashing yellow arrow is a number of factors, speeds, um, occluded views, so sight lines, uh, roadway width sometime will come into play, traffic volumes. And um, that might be the reason. That, sure. That, and I'm not, that would I'm not exactly. Sense. I just, I just wanted to know why, that, mm -hmm. since I have you here, I'm also... No, understood. Understood. Those would oftentimes be criteria or reasons that come into play for when to when or when not to implement flashing yellow arrow. I'm a big fan of flashing yellow arrow as well. Thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> Fantastic. Yeah, well, thanks a lot for sharing all this information and providing it all in the packet, too. There's a lot of information there to absorb. And so you think, yeah, what is the timeline like? You said by the end of the month, you'll kind of... Oh, so the, the study, uh, board members of the chair, or, or Mr. Chair, members of the board, uh, the study will, the, will be finalized this month. So our contract ends at the end of this month. We'll be submitting the final document to the entire technical advisory committee following a meeting that we have tomorrow with a small PMT, <coughs> a set of PMT members. Um, and then from an implementation standpoint, um, you know, nothing here is imminent on the horizon. Uh, Minnesota Department of Transportation does have a couple of projects in their capital highway improvement plan as planned projects, but they're not necessarily programmed or personal, you know, dedicated funds, but they're in their 10-year chip. That's CHIP, the capital highway improvement plan. And I believe they are 2023 to 2026 projects. And I, I actually just got a voicemail yesterday from Lisa with MnDOT District 7, the uh, District State 8 engineer. And they were funded, I believe, for 2023 for the ones that would impact Blue Earth County. However, right now she's anticipating those will be delayed by a couple of years because the pavement on the segment north of there is in more severe condition and requires treatment uh, in the more immediate future. All right, thank you. That was great. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Greg. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. We're just taking a short break right now, too. We'll be back in about five minutes or so. Okay, we're back from our break. And, uh, We've got next item of business we've got here before us today is we've got our county engineer, um, Ryan Filtis, to give us a public works update. And All right, gentlemen. Got well, uh, you've got a relatively brief agenda for today. Just one action item consideration of a resolution uh, for appointment of two gentlemen to the Park Advisory Committee. Yep. Uh, Tom and Doug both recently attended our uh, Park Advisory Board meeting for the majority of the meeting, and they were asked to uh, be excused so that we could take a vote from the Park Advisory Committee on recommendation of whether or not to uh, recommend to the board for appointment, and they were both uh, appointed. I believe there's some information in there uh, about both gentlemen, but both certainly seem like they would be a good asset to the Park Advisory Board. <laughs> I move approval. Second. second. Okay, we've got a motion for approval and a second. And um, I'd like to just mention too, I've, I've been serving on the parks board the last few years, and yes. I was there for the, you know, for for both Doug uh, Hader and Tom. How do you say the last name? Is White? Is it just Tom White? I think so. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, both of them are very, uh, what would you say, engaging, and they really enjoy uh, all the park lands that, that Blue Earth County has and beyond. They've got good extensive history to and background as far as their education and their uh, experience. Absolutely. So I mean, they're really big 
big asset I think, to the county board. And I, I know I don't know Tom that well, but I know Doug very well uh, with his past employment as the MnDOT District State Aid Engineer. And then after that, he was working for Stonebrook Consulting, yeah. and he had helped us with our uh, Parks of Regional Significance application. He had also yeah. helped us with several uh, Tiger Ted Grant applications. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and he's still willing to help us with uh, working towards that Parks of Regional Significance. In fact, I've got him added to a conference call that we're having later this week for that same purpose. So oh, good. I think it'll be uh, very helpful. Yeah, he's, good. Uh, he's a good guy, and he's a <clears throat> good uh, uh, asset for that, absolutely. Yeah. Well, this is pretty good, so. Um, any more discussion or comments? Nope. All in favor, say by, by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. All right, great. Uh, just some informational items for you. Please feel free to interject questions as we go. Uh, construction projects updates. County State Aid Highway 1, which is our old Minnesota Highway 66 project, from 90 to Mankato and the south surcharge. The road was open to traffic for the winter period on November 28th. Uh, the northern reinforced soil slopes, uh, numbers 2 and 3, were completed in the majority, with the exception of the roadway, obviously, over the top. We wanted to just give it the course of the freeze-thaw cycle, and then we'll construct the road as well as the southern RSS's and uh, the remainder of the work next year and we would anticipate the construction will resume fairly early in the spring of 2019. Uh, Mathowitz very smartly stockpiled sand at the uh, community garden site in order to be able to utilize it for uh, beginning construction prior to spring load restrictions oh. coming off uh, so they want to get after it right away in the spring next year as soon as conditions are fit to go. Great idea. Absolutely. Planning projects updates are County State at Highway 1 from 9 to 90. The plans are effectively complete. We're incorporating uh, right-of-way comments before we finalize those. Um, because of the delay associated with the uh, Army Corps of Engineers permit due to the archaeological mm -hmm. uh, investigations, we're just kind of sitting on that for the time being, moving some other projects up and forward. Likely that that'll be a 2020-let uh, project instead of 2019 as it was previously planned. County State at Highway 14 from Minnesota Highway 30 to County State at Highway 4. Uh, we received the Army Corps of Engineers permit in uh, late at the end of October. We're finalizing a handful of remaining right-of-way parcel acquisitions. We're getting down to just a, just a couple left. And we plan to bid that in uh, January or February of 19. In fact, we could probably advertise it for bids now. We just uh, want to get on the tail end of the holidays uh, so we can garner the contractor's full attention. So we'll be getting that out very early to get the contractor lined up for it. Uh, 10 from the Blue Earth River to Kasaw 1, so that's the road that runs from Vernon Center to Good Thunder. Oh, yeah. uh, as you may recall from our road tour, we are going to start just east of the river because the bridge over the river is not eligible for state bridge bonds for replacement yet, but it, we're anticipating it will be in the relatively near future. Uh, so we'll do the piece from Vernon Center through the bridge in uh, future years. So this would be the piece from east of the bridge to, uh, all the way to Kasaw 1, which is just southwest of yeah, Thunder. Uh, that plan development is continuing on. We're beginning right of way uh, information, putting together documents for acquisitions, and we're also working on getting information ready to submit for permit applications. We're still hopeful that that'll be a 2019 construction project, um, but time will tell as right of way and permit applications have really gotten to be critical path for us and uh, considerable delays just with the length of the project and the number of uh, parcels we have to acquire in addition to the, uh, obviously the Army Corps of Engineers permits is going to be a considerable delay. Mm -hmm. And then our County State Highway 17 Hafner Drive roundabout project, the 60% plans were submitted to the county. We've reviewed those with the comments back to Bolden and Mink and the design is progressing forward. Mm -hmm. So that was a good project milestone. And we're continuing to work with the impacted businesses to coordinate access concerns. Um, we're on the backage road access for the southern uh, businesses behind the IRC retail, the mall there. So we want to use the road that runs behind there uh, as a temporary access road. And then we're also working with the auto dealerships on the north side to make sure that they can get uh, their, uh, the proper term is, but the, the trucks with all the cars on top of them, get those in and out of their lot so that they can get their new inventory delivered. Yeah, that's important for them. Yeah. 
Uh, and then miscellaneous items updates. Uh, we've been working uh, for quite some time now on developing municipal maintenance agreements uh, for all of our small municipalities. We uh, wanted to really document and clarify with all the municipalities what their duties are and what our, du our duties are with respect to some of our municipal segments and get consistency among all the small municipalities. Uh, so as you, you know, we have an agreement in place with the city of Mankato already that has predetermined duties and has predetermined payment rates. So we use that as the model. We took out the activities that the small municipalities are not typically doing or just are not equipped to do that the county does. And then we took out a commensurate amount of cost that the county incurs to do those items. So we use that to establish effectively a base, base per lane mile payment rate. Uh, we drafted the municipal maintenance agreements, sent them out to the cities. Uh, we're starting to see those come back. It's really the same agreement across all the different cities and the same per lane mile payment rate so that we can keep it consistent with everybody again. Uh, Amboy, Lake Crystal, Mapleton, and Vernon Center have approved and returned the agreements to date, and we are anticipating others being returned fairly soon. So that's a five-year agreement that we've set up, and uh, it should help at least get everybody on the same page and make it a more uh, consistent and fair payment. Uh, in addition to that, as you're likely aware, the city of Eagle Lake has a force main that runs from uh, Eagle Lake along County State at Highway 17 all the way to Mankato. And if you may recall, the northeastern corner of the intersection of County State at Highway 17 and Hafner Drive, uh, the force main failed earlier this fall. And uh, when they excavated and created a suck hole, when they excavated it, they actually found that the pipe was completely gone, the old ductile iron pipe. And it was a 14-inch ductile iron pipe that was installed in 1991 under a permit from MnDOT prior to Minnesota Highway 14 being turned back to the new Highway 14 being constructed and that becoming county state of Highway 17. Um, as the uh, effluent is oxidized, it creates a, effectively a sulfuric acid that ate away at the pipe. Uh, the only reason they knew that that's where the pipe was because it, on the exterior it was bagged with a poly, uh, plastic wrap. And so they actually dug up the wrap and um, that's how they knew where the pipe was. So they were able to excavate back, make a temporary connection, which is instead of a temporary manual, which is what they're pumping from right now, uh, while they're completing obviously the sewer and water along Adam Street, uh, the future Adam Street extension, as you're seeing uh, east of County State Highway 12, the multiple excavators and all the pipe going in the ground out there. So that's a trunk sewer extension that's designed to uh, continue along the future Adam Street alignment come to the south and connect to County State that I was 17 just west of the Javens property. Mm -hmm. So um, they're actually, uh, we had received an email they're planning on doing the um, traffic control for that work setting that up today. So you'll see a lot happening out there. Um, so with respect to the sewer main that's left underneath our CASA 17, the pipe used to be about under the shoulder of the highway or right at the inslope of the road uh, of the old highway. When it was reconstructed in 2013 and 2014, the road was widened to three or four lane segments. So now the pipe is underneath um, the westbound lanes of CASA 17. Uh, so we've been working with the city on developing a way to, uh, my concern is that it's, it's a large pipe and if it's in that brittle and fragile condition that it will eventually collapse and will result in settlement of the roadway and uh, we don't want to see that on that major of a roadway with a very substantial road section that we have in place. So we're working with the city, their consultant engineer, and they're working through a contractor to try to develop a plan to sand fill as much of that pipe as possible and then try to document what has not been sand filled so that we can continue to monitor it and have an agreement in place between the city and the county uh, if there is any detrimental settlement so that we can both understand the associated risk. So the, the, the pipe would be replaced on the side of the road right away somewhere? Uh, the, no, so the, 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 the pipe will stay in place oh, well. from Eagle Lake to west of Javens will stay functional and be connected and then it will be routed to the north along the future Adam Street alignment oh, okay. into that trunk sewer. So they're doing all that digging all the right field out there? Okay, that's all. From sewer. Javens to effectively Hafner Drive, yeah. 
will be abandoned. So that's the one where we'll see a little bit of work going on out there to expose the pipe in locations where we can minimize road damage and try to sand fill as much of that as possible. We had explored alternative ways to try to fill the pipe, but because there's a, you know, at least a mile and a half of pipe out there without digging the road up every thousand feet, which I'm not a big advocate of, um, it, it's very challenging to access that pipe and get, get fill the flow that far. <clears throat> Um, then just one last item, just as an FYI, we have also been working with FEMA on flooding reimbursement for damages occurred this year. Uh, our staff have been meeting with FEMA staff and providing documentation. We're looking at about $39,000 worth of reimbursement uh, that's estimated for CASA 1 debris against the trestle and CASA 33 of cleaning out sediment from ponds and waterways. And actually with respect to FEMA damages, this is relatively small than what we've incurred in past years. Uh, but it is time consuming for our staff to obviously do the repair, oh, yeah. but then honestly the uh, FEMA documentation is a uh, drawn out process that uh, requires a lot of coordination and, and oversight from our supervisory staff. I have had a few people ask me about the debris on the one pier at the red jacket. I don't know if that's, is that that's the one I was talking about. Is that the one you're talking about? Yep. Yeah. The, the, the same pier that got piled up on before and then it sh shot the water over to the other pier and it dissolved the other pier basically. So. Yep, and if you remember when we had to do the emergency project, that's why we put that, that armoring on the face of it with that uh, collared steel plate that was yeah. back filled with concrete so that we could protect that pier. Yeah. Yep. So that, that ends my information. I'd be more happy to answer any questions that you might have. Any questions? Thank you. Thank you, Ryan. Thanks, Thanks a lot, Ryan. Thank you, Jim. Thank, Thank you. All right. And so our next uh, item of business we've got before us this morning, uh, we've got our county attorney, Pat McDermott, here. And uh, give us a county update. Good morning, Pat. Good morning, Pat. Good morning, Chair sure, Commissioners. Uh, today I really don't have much to add uh, other than what's in the report. If you have any questions, any concerns, any comments, uh, just to, I think most if not all of you know that we've recently hired uh, three more attorneys in the office, hopefully getting us back up to full speed since we've been short for a while and uh, have been working a little bit on getting them trained in and taking care of some of the other things that have been put on the back burner, so to speak, for a while. So unless you have any specific questions or whatnot, I will let you, Mr. Chair. Just curious, I think I asked this once before, but on the one, uh, you know, types of city of Mankato criminal case findings, yep. and that green property wasn't being collected before, or we weren't looking at it before, or is that, what does that mean? Can you just tell me what that means? Is that like when somebody damages somebody's property? A property offense, it could be a theft, it could be a, it could be a damage to property, um, something of, of that nature typically is what it would be. You know, we, we just try to utilize the same type of, uh, of uh, categories uh, to be consistent, so in, I mean, we can break it down much further if we need to, but just um, we keep track of the ordinance violations because of the city of Mankato and a college town, the ordinances are, are pretty important in college towns because of some of the, the, those types of offenses, but just those generic types of issues, the property offenses would typically be your, your theft related and your criminal damage to property, uh, something along those, those lines because there are quite a number of, of shoplifting cases, cases over the course of time. So, and then 17, 16, we don't have any of those on there, so we don't have them listed, so is that because we were just collecting that information before? Is what they were? I, I, I wasn't collecting them because we didn't work providing them the prosecution services. Oh. So once we started providing prosecution yep. services, I started keeping track the same way that I try to keep track, that we keep track on the, the county cases. Oh, okay. um, we keep track of things just slightly differently, you know, and you always see the, uh, a couple of the more um, on the county side of things yeah. that uh, we keep track of different categories as well. And some of the, the voter ones, uh, you know, we don't hardly see any of those, but those are important because of the statutory requirements of both the sheriff and, and the county attorney. So we track those as well. But just from the overall standpoint, we try to be consistent in how we keep track of cases because those are the broad categories that we would break them down into. 
Yeah, it's quite a few over 300. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. <coughs> any other questions, concerns, or comments? Anybody? Nope. I don't have any. Good report. Point. Thank you very Good much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Report. <coughs> Next item we have today before us is our administrative services with uh, Mr. Bob Meyer, our county administrator. Help us. Mr. Walk Chair and Commissioners, the first item is the county board minutes from November 27th. Move the minutes. Second. We've got a motion for approval and a second on our county board minutes from our last meeting on November 27th. Any additions or comments? All in favor, signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Next are the uh, bills for the two weeks indicated. Move the bills. Second. We got a motion for approval and uh, second on our financial transactions listed in the packet. There's two weeks listed. Is there any comments or questions? No. I only had one marked down. I didn't have time to really go through in extreme detail, but there's one on the second week. B and W Control Specialists Incorporated for seventeen thousand eight hundred sixty-four dollars. I, I I don't remember ever seeing that. B and W that was that's Bob's private car. Well, it is not for seventeen thousand okay. dollars. It's not. Is that just some service <laughs> work at B and W, Bob? Or no. <laughs> I was a kid. That'd be repair bill, BMW. Uh, that is some repairs to ditches, so no car for Bob. No car. Uh, they, um, I figured it didn't mean, I figured it was a different set of yeah, the water work. Before, but I thought we had them. I that'd be I an old know. used BMW. Yeah. <laughs> I wonder what, I mean, what, what, the, what the words are for BMW construction. So it's B, B and W control specialist. It's a it's a, a number of different ditches, and so I don't know if it's repairs or tree removal types of activities. Oh, I have spring. So See the spring it might be spraying. We jump oh, around those. Yeah. Spraying. Yeah. We jump around those all the time. But so. yeah. contract, we get one every yeah. week. Contract. Spraying. I bet it's spraying. I bet it's just yeah. that control. So we did get another person. Oh, okay. It's hard to find people to do that. Yeah. Oh yeah. And they're usually uh, licensed and bonded mm -hmm. or whatever to do that stuff. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. okay. All right. Anybody else have something? All those in favor, see what I've saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Mr. Chair and Commissioners, I have number six in your packet then as the Human Resources Department agenda. We do have one action item for your consideration today, and that is authorization for the County Board Chairperson and County Administrator to sign an agreement with the International Union of Operating Engineers, Local 49, uh, for a uh, contract covering calendar years 2019 and 20. So this is a two-year agreement. Uh, this is our uh, uh, highway workers. Um, the agreement basically covers a lot of the same provisions that uh, we have in place with other unions. Um, as I mentioned, the two-year agreement, 2% uh, uh, general wage adjustment in each of the years covered by this agreement. It also incorporates some of the insurance changes that uh, we've been working on in terms of the cost shares uh, for the employer and the employee, as well as the introduction of a high deductible health plan with the HSA contribution. There also uh, in this uh, particular agreement was um, an agreement to allow a three hour callback for snow plowing or other sorts of work that the highway staff are going to do that's up from a two hour minimum. Oh. And so I just wanted the board to be aware of that because that was one of the major discussion points brought uh, forward by the union. Oh. Be happy to answer questions that the board might have on this particular item. I'll move approval. Second. second. We've got a motion for approval and a second. And uh, I'd like to say thank you for working on this. And thanks to the, uh, I guess our staff up there too for sure. working yeah. on this and trying to get it done. And I know it's hard to sometimes get meetings together, you know what I mean, to get meeting times. Mm -hmm. um, since we've got all those unions. How many people are in that union, Bob and Bob? Well, I would guess there's 30, 30 something. roughly. Okay, just curious, yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, anybody else? 
All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Motion carries. The informational items then we did uh, fill two positions within the corrections department, one being a probation officer and the other being a clerical specialist. Um, we did receive a resignation of a custody officer and so we will be recruiting uh, for that jail position and then we've initiated a recruitment for two other positions as a result of early retirements, one being in our information technology department and application developer and business analyst and then um, the taxpayer and records or taxation and records supervisor within the taxpayer services unit. Right. Yeah, and then I, I sent a note in, which I included you guys on, for the uh, application developer, business analyst, and the taxation and record supervisor. So that's as a result of uh, the early retirement incentives that were that were developed. And right. Normally, you would see kind of a one-to-one -one relationship yeah. with people leaving and the the initiation of recruitment, but because of the early retirement program, those folks that are leaving were on a previous uh, HR agenda in front of the board right. months ago, and so right. it well, looks a little um, odd at this yeah. point, but we are right. seeing a number of people that are finishing out their careers here at the end of the year, yeah. and so mm -hmm. um, we're bringing those forward at this and point. That was 26 we had all the other five? 25. 25. 25 people. That's pretty amazing. We're losing a lot of uh, well, uh, knowledgeable folks that have worked for the county for a long time on some of these cases and um, losing that knowledge, you know, is kind of a... Do we wonder if we have an agreement where we can call them at home and uh, ask for questions? <laughs> <laughs> call it a consulting fee. Consulting fee. <laughs> yeah, put them for a consultant for a while. <laughs> uh, <clears throat> Thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Chair and Commissioners, item number seven in your packet then is a renewal of uh, 2019 on-sale liquor licenses. Uh -huh. um, we have four entities that have submitted the paperwork. That paperwork has been reviewed by the county attorney and the sheriff, um, and so we're recommending approval of those four entities, Indian Island Winery, Mount Cato, Terrace View Golf Course, and the Windmill in Mapleton. Move to approve. Second. We have a motion for approval and a second on the uh, on sale liquor licenses for these four establishments in the county. Is there any discussion or questions? All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. And these, these come before us every year. These mm -hmm. yep, the that's so, correct. Yeah. Item number eight in your packet then is a renewal of tobacco licenses that would be effective for calendar year 2019. Again, all the applicants have completed the required paperwork and submitted the license fee. And so uh, the eight entities here are uh, Casey's General Store, both in Eagle Lake and Mapleton, uh, the LaHillier Quick Mart, uh, Dites Foods in Mapleton, Eagle Express, uh, Maple Mart in Mapleton, the Mapleton Municipal Liquor Store, and Mitts BP in St. Clair. I move approval. Second. We've got a motion uh, for approval. Mr. Brunder, a second from, I believe, Will. Yeah. And uh, so there's eight of them here. And um, just a comment before we vote on them. I know that when we go to meetings throughout the state sometimes or talk to other counties, there's that T21, you know, mm -hmm. people always talk about that, you know, and trying to get it to the age 21. And they're really hopeful that if that's going to move forward, that the, that the state would maybe take that up. Instead of leaving it up to individual counties and cities to do it, you know, that they, that it, it just causes somebody to just go across the line and buy some cigarettes. And it's just, you know, if, if, if they're really serious about it, it should be a statewide, statewide uh, I just have a question. If you have, yeah. Do you know if they're still doing the tobacco and alcohol compliance checks as part of these licensing? I believe they are. Yeah, okay. they are. Good. They are for sure. Okay, <laughs> good. good. I've bumped into a few people at the stores that part time they do, they do uh, young folks that do compliance checks on different ones. Yeah, good. All right. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. 
Item number nine in your packet are appointments for the environmental services committees. Um, those committees are the Recycling Education Committee, the Planning Commission, and the Board of Adjustment. Uh, for the Recycling Education Committee, we have a um, recommendation to reappoint uh, two members, Sharon Tanley and Ann Ludwig, um, and then a new appointee, Madeline, oh, I'll butcher this name, <laughs> I'm sorry. Chelsbig. Chelsbig, that sounds right. Um, for the Planning Commission, we have uh, reappointments of Bill Anderson and Joe Smentek, and for the Board of Adjustment, a reappointment of those two individuals as well. Move approval. Second. We've got a motion for approval and a second on these um, county committee assignments and reassignments. Um, is there any discussion or comments? If you ever wonder about immigration issues, you can just look at some of these names and you know, you know, sometimes where their backgrounds are from, you know, or their or their spouse. But yeah. It's kind of interesting. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? Motion carries. Item number 10 in your packet is um, approval of the 2019 Violent Crime Enforcement Team Grant Agreement. This is grant funding that supports our uh, drug task force. And so the grant for 2019 will be $152,000 awarded to the uh, Sheriff's Department. So we're recommending approval of this grant amendment. Move to approve. Second. Got a motion for approval from Mr. Stromberg and a second from Mr. Um, Purvis, both retired enforcement officers. <laughs> Let them have it. Yeah. Is there any comments? Uh, no, Mr. good Good program. Um, okay. Sounds good. I know we do this every year pretty much, I think. Mm -hmm. This becomes up, doesn't it? Yes. Yeah. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Those opposed? <laughs> Carries. Item number 11 in your packet is the financial status report for November. Um, our uh, total revenue is at slightly over 105 million with expenses um, at 93.4 million. Um, this is really um, a little bit of a surprise in that we continue to see the impacts of those turn back funds that uh, um, came in before the work has been fully completed there. So that's distorted the financial picture a little bit uh, to the positive. We'll see that come back around probably in 2019. Um, overall, though, the revenues are really right on pace with uh, our budget for the year. Uh, the expenses are uh, lagging a little bit behind. So overall, uh, we're sitting in uh, good shape, I would say. Um, obviously, uh, December is a busy month for kind of getting all the bills caught up and stuff. So um, I anticipate that we'll finish out the, the year in a very different kind of bottom line picture than we anticipated just because of, um, of really two big things, the turn back funds and the decision to move ahead with some bonding for the government center project. In terms of the enterprise fund, which is the Ponderosa landfill, you'll see that revenues are exceeding expenses there. Again, largely driven by uh, no cell development when we do the big capital um, and kind of developments, whether it's cell development or purchasing the large equipment out there, that picture can change quite a bit, but uh, we didn't have a lot of that uh, machinery and land improvement activity in 2018. <clears throat> the second page then gets into our cash balances and you'll see that our total county funds sits at 120 4 million uh, at this point in time. Again, you know, if you look up on the public works line, you'll see that uh, this this time last year, uh, we had just under $4 million in fund balance for the public works department. We're currently sitting at 12.8. So those are those turn back funds. Okay. Be happy to answer any other questions the board might have. Any questions or comments about the uh, financial? 
So the turn back funds, Bob, is that uh, some of the turn back funds are um, billed as we, we pay them first, and they, but these turn back funds are coming in before we're actually paying the bills? Um, I anticipated that we would be getting reimbursed, but yes, yeah. they did send us a very large check in advance of some of one, I'm assuming. Yes, okay. that's correct. Right. And I don't know if it was a case where the state needed to clear out some of their accounts mm -hmm. or what exactly happened there. We'll take it. Yeah, we'll, yeah, we'll take we it. can hold it. No <laughs> cash. I think there's a budgetary reason for that too, because they know they have to pay it. I'm sure the state yeah. wants to get that yep. moving and before their next new budget year. I would imagine that yeah. was the case. Mm -hmm. um, and yeah. so interest in investments is wondering. It says 216 percent. We've got you know basically almost double what we expected. Over 17. I mean. Um, was, was, is there any comments on that, Bob? It's on our first page there. At, um, sure. Um, one point, well, one million seven hundred fifty-four dollars. Is that what that is? Or? That's correct. Um, yeah, I think it is kind of indicative of the changing marketplace with interest rates going up and then um, bonds are more secure and when you see some of the activity with the stock market, oh. um, they may be performing a little better. So yeah, it is a very positive yeah. piece in terms of uh, those return on our investments. Yeah, that's very good. And would some of that money, like the bond money, would some of that be invested? So would that help? And we got the bond money we haven't spent yet, the money we got from the state. Oh, absolutely. A it's, mix of it. It's roughly a 20% increase yeah. in our fund balance. And fund balance. So that's uh, generating. We have more to invest. Yeah. Wow. Good for them. Good job. Then is it reflected on here or is that next year will be? I think we got a check. We get a check back from is it MCIT from our risk managers? And um, the timing of that, I believe, will be next year. But, yeah. but I mean, it. We have um, last year's check in this year's data. Okay. You know, so it yeah. it's been an every year um, uh, refund or dividend. Yeah. But they continue to caution us that uh, uh, we shouldn't always expect that because um, <laughs> that's because they're good at uh, managing risk and. Right. Well, hopefully it will continue, but uh, you know, with um, their um, ability to get better in terms of predicting risk, they may uh, not be holding as much in reserve, and so sure. um, those returns may look different into the future. I don't remember exactly. Was it 200? And the letter came out. Probably about a year. quarter million was what yeah. we got this yeah, last year. Yeah, fifty some thousand or something. Yeah. I forgot that I was going to throw that in the mailbox for everybody to look at. Yeah, if you got one, but you get one, Bob, yeah. or, Yes. Yeah. For MCIT. And then uh, just curious about the land improvements down there on the Enterprise Fund. Um, in 17, we had 1.1 1 .1 something million, and then only $164,000 in 18. Uh, you know, in 2017, we did add a sell out at the landfill, and yeah. so that's reflected in Mainly those numbers. That. That's, oh, okay. Yep. I just thought it'd be more. Yeah, I just thought it might be, but. Okay. All righty. <coughs> Anything else? Well, thank you. Thank you. The next thing we've got here then is our commissioner's reports on our involvements in committees. And uh, who would like to start us off? Yep, I'll start. Okay, sure. After the last meeting, we had our fall recognition for our employees with their past years of service. Another nice program. I know it's not a whole lot that the county does, but I think it's nice. And the few people I talked to, I talked to quite a few people, but the few people asked the question if they enjoyed it, they, they said it was nice. It took the time to do it. So uh, appreciative of the people that show up for that. 
at uh, one of our first meetings and of many for our highway department that we're going to be looking at some remodeling or rebuilding of the highway shop up there in the future, not in the near future, but a lot of discussion going on around that project. <laughs> Don't have one project done yet, but we're going to start on another one. But as we all know, it takes a lot of time and planning. So I got to meet with the, some of the staff and talk about some of the challenges they have up there. And of course, we'll have a work session on that item after they get the plans put together and this feasibility study put back together. We were out all, all up at AMC. I just made it up for the one day, made it to several different things. Uh, had a nice program that night. I uh, got back from that, and then I had uh, we had two 4-H interviews last year for our 4-H program director, which will be chosen maybe by the end of January, I believe, but we did have two good candidates, and so that process is moving along. Again, we just do the interviews here, but most of it is handled through the University of Minnesota. So we give all our input, and then they send it up to the university, and it's actually kind of a complicated process. They advertise these and, and interview them statewide and then they just have a pool and then they pick these candidates to come and run the program so as part of that had um, four uh, uh, planning and zoning meeting the other night had a couple items on the agenda got our first public hearing done for our land use plan and have any had one person come and testify a little bit about some issues and some solar questions but we will be seeing that uh, I believe next next week yeah. already so but uh, the staff did a good job and had it all put back together and uh, long time coming to get it done so be nice to see that get approved then we had SWCD, Will and I, and their, things are going uh, very well there. They're wrapping up some projects from last year, but already starting to get the tree program and stuff ready and uh, geared up for next year already. Ooh. So, and Emily Javins has retired or not retired or resigned. She had a had a conflict with another job, so her years of service were acknowledged. And they have did they they picked and approved another person already. Correct, Will Chris Hughes? Did yeah. they? Yeah, yeah. So they got another supervisor coming on board right now. Oh. Well, point because okay. she wasn't up for re-election so the things are going well there and yesterday I had uh, MRCI finance committee we got uh, we were gonna have a board meeting yesterday but uh, with December being so busy we just decided to get the MRCI finance committee together and things are going really well there we're ahead of schedule for uh, income so it looks like we'll have a have another good year this year and then several ditch and other uh, meetings with cons constituents throughout the last couple weeks. That's well, my report, Mr. Chair. Very good, very good. Who would like to be next? I can go, Mr. Stuber. Um, Thank you. Again, after our uh, last board meeting, we had our employee recognition, and that was, uh, that's always a, a good, good uh, thing to do. November 28th, I had an Alliance, uh, Transportation Alliance Executive Committee meeting up in St. Paul. On uh, November 29th, uh, I went to um, the SEC where Tim Walls uh, spoke and, and um, asked for questions, and I, I did bring some transportation issues towards uh, them and and I you know we'll see what happens with transportation this year with um, Tim Walls as governor and having the House Democrats this year so that should uh, be another interesting spot. Um, December first, I played Santa for uh, Hilltop Methodist. Nice, and that was they have their uh, uh, yearly Christmas festival and asked me and uh, it was fun, a lot of fun. You had, you, had a pretty, of the meeting. you had a pretty good elf helper along with I you. Did, I did, I did. Uh, I had grandma elf. <laughs> uh, you, you betcha. So you had a, afterwards, uh, you, I hope you had a good whole hole there. Well, whole ho 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 ho. <laughs> Anyway, December 2nd, uh, it was on Sunday, the uh, AMC annual conference started. I went to Ag and Rural Development. Uh, we had uh, USDA spa uh, state leaders Brad Finstead and Joe Martin. Brad Finstead used to be a legislator. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, one of the biggest talks there was broadband yeah. uh, across the state. Um, 
go on to the next morning, December 3rd, uh, we we started the uh, transport. I'm um, the Transportation Infrastructure Policy Committee uh, started out, and uh, we had the Office of Broadband Development update uh, with our the Executive Director of Deed was there. Um, one one of those issues, and I'm gonna and I made some copies and I'm going to send them around to you. Okay, we got uh, this, these copies come straight from the uh, Minnesota Employment and Economic Development. Here, you can give one to Trey if he wants one. Okay. Um, and uh, it shows, it shows, uh, I think the last page shows the state of Minnesota and shows on the, um, for the 100 megabit, we are down to only having 14.13% of our, our uh, people across the uh, county that have uh, that type, which would be required uh, to have fiber, okay? Um, you know, I I look more into this, and and they on this website you can punch up. In fact, you can see a better picture on the website than this copy. Punch up the county. Um, actually, uh, we have in in Blue Earth County in, in Mankato. You can see the the light green. Um, actually, is is the. 100 megabit. That is, uh, in Mankato, is basically what's there is what we put around the, the city of Mankato years ago. Okay? As the county wanted to get fiber across, uh, surrounding Mankato, and you can see it comes, comes straight to our, you know, straight to us and the surrounding. It's, it's kind of disheartening that Blue Earth County, being a regional center, being what I consider the best county in the state of Minnesota, doesn't have uh, 100 megabits across the county when other counties uh, that are, are much smaller and much uh, um, don't have the, the same type of uh, interest for industry and, and colleges and stuff um, are doing so much better. And uh, I would I would like to propose and I'd like to, to, to work on in the future getting two of the biggest uh, players in this, which would be uh, Charter and uh, Consolidated along with um, Jaguar and, and do possibly do a public-private partnership and see what we can do uh, and maybe get a grant uh, from Deed, maybe get something to get us uh, in here in Blue Earth County so we can be up in that 98 percentile so we, we can do it. It would start by getting um, conduits put in the, in the roads and so we can have uh, fiber throughout it would get uh, you know so we have to have a different frame of mind when we build our roads um, also city of Mankato when they build their roads so that's I'll get off my soapbox but uh, uh, it's it's like I said it's kind of disheartening that here in Mankato and Blue Earth County we don't have the same um, ability to get the internet service that some of the smaller communities uh, you notice in in the uh, that Madison Lake is almost covered with with uh, 100 percent with that light green that goes through there and uh, it looks like Elysian is covered 100 um, percent but interject one yeah. just a minute go ahead I uh, I did some research on this uh, probably a couple of years now very very same came up with the very same information and the things that I found was that the smaller communities are relatively well served okay. uh, it's basically the rural areas right. that uh, that don't have it. Uh, most most of the small communities have have fiber run to them, and so okay. very short distance around the community is pretty well served uh, by by that uh, internet service. It's the the rural.
several areas that uh, uh, that, that aren't served. So I, I support what what you're saying. We really yeah. do have it's, to focus on. You know, the I don't I don't have an answer. Yeah, like yeah. Not, none of us are experts on this, but yeah. there are people that are, and there's there's other counties that have mm -hmm. have run the fiber and have, have done this, and uh, I I just think Blue Earth County needs to get on board. Yeah. Okay, I'll, I'll go on. Uh, December uh, 3rd uh, through the AMC, we had our transportation infrastructure. Uh, we did our five-year transit system plan for Greater Minnesota Transit. Uh, and then we approved our legislative issues and uh, I was uh, blessed on being uh, elected chair of the committee this year. So I've got, uh, I've got two years on there as uh, chair of the Transportation and Infrastructure Policy Committee. Um, in the general session that day, we had a keynote, keynote speaker, was a Matt Jones, uh, and he had kind of an inspirational uh, leadership speaker. Uh, Pretty, pretty fun guy to listen to. Um, gave gave away free books, <coughs> free books. So I I got my free books and it has got a lot of neat little sayings. And did you get an autograph? I did. Yeah, I did. Um, then I volunteered at the backpack build event. I think you did that too, didn't you? Well, no, I didn't. Okay, make it. I had something okay. Else. That's for the Kids in Need Foundation. Um, and then uh, I went through a, a class on understanding healthcare and retirement. I think me and Will and I was through there. all, I was you there. know, it's funny as <laughs> old people do that. Yeah. Funny, uh, funny how that's. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I went to a, a segment on supporting a resilient housing system. Uh, and then I went to the past presidents and retiring commissioners reception and the dinner and awards uh, uh, dinner. On December 4th, uh, again, we started out the morning uh, with our annual meeting, and then I went to a segment on We Can Still Smile, enhancing staff while being in the midst of this difficult work we do, and it's, it's uh, how we help staff with stress and stuff, just, just kind of giving positive outlooks. Uh, we had lunch, and then we went home on December 5th at a department head meeting. On uh, December 6th, I had a township officers meeting. Let me see here. December 7th, I had an all seasons arena meeting. And then yesterday, I had an exec, I had a transportation alliance meeting up in St. Paul for the board. And that was it. Yeah, nice. We should have got a lot of time on that one, Trey. <laughs> <laughs> go ahead. Yeah. yeah. Well, to call on Mark people. No, no, no. Oh, that's right. Go ahead. Go ahead. Go ahead. Does it matter? Okay. Um. <laughs> <laughs> we had, uh, let's see, on uh, the 27th of November, the employee recognition uh, reception there. And, all. Uh, and of course, AMC has advanced. Uh, Talk a little bit at length. It's all that. Um, yeah, I was at the resil the a couple of good ones, but the resiliency of uh, housing for affordable housing and accessibility and stuff. That was I guess kind of my alley. So that was you know, formative and interesting. Met some people that were kind of doing the same things, or involved with the same things in their community as as uh, we are here. Um, that was all good and. Uh, the venue a little different with it. Uh, and of course, the attendance was up, but it was um, it definitely was crowded everywhere because of that uh, rats in there. So it was interesting. Um, then on the uh, fifth, you had department heads, and then the sixth, uh, yeah, you had the township, but I had our, our uh, Maple, our last meeting of the year. I had to get some of the projects approved, and then. Uh, and then we did have a report from Craig at the same time. Uh, then they had uh, on the uh, Thursday, December 7th, had uh, I went with Commissioner Struberg to his uh, All Seasons Arena on the uh, Three Seasons or the Ice Arena there. And uh, 
<laughs> the whole board is being replaced with new people. Oh, so, wow. We'll lose yeah, they, all of that. They were kind of shocked with knowledge. When I, when I let them know that you well, you know, I kind of so. knew it, but I just didn't think about it and picture it because I knew, like, First. Mayor Skyline was here, and I just didn't <laughs> put it all together. <laughs> Everybody's gone. Wow. <laughs> Bob Freiberg, you know, yeah. the mayor from Eric Mankato. Anderson, and, something about it anyway. You do. You do. Um, you're, you're, you're going to do just fine. <laughs> After that, I did have Semrex, the, uh, the Southeast Minnesota Recyclers Exchange, we're still involved with that, and uh, Molly and Dave, of course, from Environmental Services were there. I guess Molly took uh, Jean Lundquist's place and replaced her, and uh, she's just getting learned a little bit about what's going on and sort of things she'll, she'll be dealing with. And then we had, uh, oh, yesterday did have um, my partners, we just had a meeting on our uh, upcoming events. We're going to try to help you know, for fundraising. So that concludes my report, Mr. Okay. Chair. Very good. Thank you. Oh. So, okay, you ready for me? Service, yeah. <laughs> okay, of course, we had the employee recognition event that's already been mentioned. And then uh, at the AMC conference, we had uh, started off with the public safety committee meeting on uh, the 3rd. Uh, that's some really good speakers. We heard from uh, Nate Grove, the executive director of the Post Board. Uh, he talked about a sexual assault investigation <laughs> model policy that uh, was, was very, very interesting. And uh, basically best practices for sexual assault investigations. We heard from Bob, Bob Small, the uh, executive director of the uh, County Attorneys Association. Uh, again, talked about more legislative issues. Uh, then we heard from uh, Bill Hutton, the executive director of the Minnesota Sheriff's Association. Uh, and finally, uh, Commissioner Tom Roy uh, from the Department of Corrections. And he reminded us all that he was the only commissioner that lived on a gravel road, mm. and I took it. I told him, asked him if he owned a septic tank too. But he <laughs> 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 so he's the only state commissioner that lives on a gravel. Road. That's a good one. Um, and then, of course, we went on to the platform <coughs> amendment review, and and um, Vance and I uh, both brought forward a resolution in our committee. So he and the transportation committee, and I and the public safety committee to support a res resolution. Uh, that would support uh, legislation for hands-free um, uh, techniques and car, cars and stuff, and that, uh, that passed our committee unanimously. Yeah, I'm sure. Same, same thing with transportation. It was uh, one of those, um, I hate to use the word, no-brainer yeah, yeah. Uh, type of thing that everybody understands that uh, it's those things are uh, people using <laughs> their cell phones are causing more accidents nowadays yeah. than the D DWIs are. Yeah. So uh, we got to do something to, yeah. to, to fix this. Yeah, absolutely. So, and then of course, um, um, I also attended the session on uh, understanding healthcare in retirement put on by Nationwide. Um, uh, that was very, very interesting. The past presidents. Uh, um, and the awards banquet that evening, and of course the uh, uh, election of officers the next morning, and then uh, I attended the uh, sexual assault training. Uh, uh, it's a program that's being started by Ramsey County, and it's uh, start by believing. And uh, Commissioner McDonough from uh, Ramsey County and uh, the county attorney there, and their, their folks from the Sexual Resource Center uh, put on a good presentation of an initiative that they're uh, doing in Ramsey County. Uh, as I listened to it, I felt like what I knew of how we do things in Boers County, we're doing a pretty good job. Uh, so uh, very interesting to uh, hear what what uh, what they had going. And then, of course, the um, uh, meeting and uh, wrap, wrapped up the conference. I thought it was an excellent conference. And uh, so we had department heads the uh, next day. And uh, then on the 6th, we had uh, Kip and I were both at the SWCD. He covered that well. And then Vance and I were at the township officers that evening. So busy, busy time of the year, but uh, a, lot of, a lot of good stuff. Yeah. Did you get the update? The I did. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. That's good. 
Well, thank you, Commissioner. I guess I've got a fairly short report. Um, of course, I was at the uh, our last board meeting, and of course, early that morning, I know we mentioned it once before, but we had the new employee also meets and greets, which is a good time. Then we had our board meeting and our, our Midtown Tavern uh, luncheon and our fall employee recognition event that afternoon. And I just want to mention later on that day, I, my wife and I <coughs> went to Medelia, uh, outgoing uh, hospital administrator, Candace Fenske, uh, retiring out there, she's been there for many years. And I got to know her as a member of Region 9 Development Commission. She's a commissioner who was on there. And um, I was on, I've been on there this, this whole time too. And uh, I got to know her for a short time when I served on MINRA. So, it was, so there's a connection there with the county business. And uh, also my wife runs a nursing home there so she gets to know her. Um, on the 28th of Wednesday there, we uh, went to a, a shack call-in meeting I had and um, we're preparing for our final uh, quarterly meeting, which is uh, December 14th at the St. Paul. So that's this, this Friday. And I've been serving as chair there this year. And uh, a lot of uh, good work groups will be giving a report out there. Uh, of course, there's people applying for uh, who's going to be the commissioner of all the various departments within the state. And, you know, we currently have Jan Malcolm, and she's been a great one for this year to, to be our commissioner for Minnesota Department of Health. But, but, we have the new governor coming in and the new administration, so we'll see uh, where things are. And then, uh, let's see here. I had a luncheon, I want to mention, uh, with some strategic people in our region. Uh, we talked about things in our community and how they're serving. A uh, representative uh, from uh, Vine was there. We had uh, somebody from Lutheran Social Services that serves the statewide. Uh, and uh, we had somebody from Catholic Charities who's very experienced in justice ministries throughout the country. And then we had uh, a representative, statewide representative from the Joint Religious Le Legislative Committee. If you've heard about them, JRLC. They've been doing some conversations in our community about you know, diversity and, and um, issues related to different faiths. And then uh, Friday, uh, I went to the Grand in New Ulm. I just want to mention that because they have a very nice, uh, it's called the Grand, and it, it's for the arts over there. Have you ever been there before? It's an old hotel that was fixed up. Oh, no, I've heard about it. Yeah, you I have not been there. You really should go no. check it out. they got wonderful yeah, artists good. Yeah, in the area. Where's the hotel? It's right downtown. Oh, right wow, downtown. Really? It's an old, old hotel building. It's been refurbished mm -hmm. into uh, uh, art uh, display, and they have classes there. music on the weekends, okay. every weekend. Is that in Minnesota then? The, the yeah, right down the main drag. Oh, hmm. right in the middle of town. Same. Really should go. And um, anyway, it's, I think the arts, when you develop your arts in your community, it makes for a richer community. Mm -hmm. It really makes a difference. Uh, Monday, Tuesday, of course, I was also at the AMC conference. I got there late Sunday night and uh, attended uh, several breakouts. I'll just make a few comments. The, the name of the, the uh, conference was Complete Leadership, Cultivating Innovation and Influence with Logic and Creativity. It kind of conjures up a lot of uh, ideas, you know. And I know I'm looking over here at Jesse, and she was there too for the conference. And um, Bob was there. Um, and so was Josh. Who else am I missing? Ryan. Ryan. Oh, Ryan. 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 Just, pardon. Michael. 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 Michael Salberger from our taxpayers. Laura from HR. Laura Elbeck from our HR. So we had, we had quite an entourage from our county representing um, Blue Earth County. And that's where all 87 counties get together to learn and grow and compare notes. Um, I even want to say this time I spent more time than I haven't in the past with some of the vendors. But I have, every time I have, I've not regretted it because they are really working hard. I know it's business for a lot of them, but they're working hard to help uh, help counties and local governments solve issues. And they, they, they really are up on top of things. They really have a lot of knowledge that, that's there if you want to tap into it. And, and I think over the years, I've actually helped bring some things to, to Blue Earth County 
incidentally, sometimes through that, or we've done some research and found a different vendor because of that, you know, or whatever it might be. Um, I attended that healthcare and retirement uh, breakout, and, and I know personally it has a reflection, but also you, you think about our constituents here in our county. Um, as people retire, we have more baby boomers retiring throughout the country than ever before. and. There's a lot of unexpected medical costs yeah. that they talked about at this thing. It's just people don't really plan for numbers that he put together. Oh, phenomenal! It was, wasn't it? Yeah. So there was there were some other side issues there, thinking about our how we're, how we're doing medical care nowadays and how we really do need to address and try to solve that issue. And then uh, I want to mention the Susan Bauer, or is it Brower? Minnesota State Demographer. Yeah. And we've heard her speak several yeah. times here in Duluth County. But to say, yeah. yeah, she had some good things to share with us. Uh, and that speaker you mentioned, about Matt Jones, who spoke um, on leadership. He, the thing I got that uh, sticks in my mind is he said he had something to give us and something to offer us. And a lot of times we don't think about that. You know, when you go to a, a lesson or you go to a teaching or there's somebody speaking, but that person's offering a gift for you. And he kept saying, I have a gift for you to give you. And it was about his life and about himself. And he feels that he had gained some things to share with us that were of importance. And um, talked about how many times people smile when they're children and how that just completely reduces as, uh, as we age, it just goes way down. <laughs> And how, how can we arrange our lives so that we, we are a little bit more in the moment like children? Not necessarily totally, but you know, thankful, enjoy each other, enjoy our times, and um, try to smile a little bit more. It makes a difference. And then, uh, of course, we had our AMC business meeting, uh, outgoing Susan Morris. Uh, she's done a great job as our president for AMC uh, for this last year. And then Scott from Anoka County, do you remember his last name? Schultes. 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 Yeah, he's coming in, and um, my phone is really goofy. It, it's uh, that one thing listening to me talk. So great, great stuff. Um, all in all, very enjoyable. My last AMC conference, and so I just want to mention they had something they used to do, I guess, years ago. But the choir was singing. I sing in the choir mm -hmm. for several years. I was the director for the choir, and then handed that off to Susan Morris for the AMC choir as we get together. And they had all eight signs sang, sung many times through, while the outgoing commissioners uh, were in front in a receiving line. And it was kind of emotional, really, yeah. very emotional, shaking hands with literally probably uh, almost a couple hundred people. Oh yeah. Coming through. Yeah. Yeah. To yeah. thank us for our service. And I thought that was kind of beautiful. Obviously, some of them were there for been serving for you know 30 years, and some down to me nine years or seven yeah. years. Yeah. And uh, it was quite emotional. So that was a great AMC uh, event. Then we had, of course, our department head meeting on Wednesday, the fifth, Thursday, the sixth. MnDOT TZD Steering Committee, reflecting what you're talking about here with a hands-free phone issue. Um, we've had our fatal and serious crash review. And this is this is for the South Central TZD Steering Committee, so it's about 27 counties. And Captain Jeremy Geiger, wonderful state trooper who uh, leads us through this meeting, helped us uh, also. We do what we call a fatal and serious crash review every so often. And we hear about the accidents and the details, and possibly what happened, trying to re put some of it together again and see is there anything we're missing, looking at the law enforcement and the education, the engineering, the EMS, the emergency services. Um, put that all together. And I've been, that's my last meeting as a commissioner. Um, I've attended all those these last nine years and uh, really uh, a great group of people who care about making a difference in our community. And uh, December 7th, uh, let's see here. Oh, I had a meeting with a environmental services staff person to talk about a residential concern. Spent about an hour and a half talking about it. And then uh, last night, if you haven't gone, very beautiful, you know, the Kiwanis Holiday Lights uh, event down at Sibley Park. So the Optimist Club is one of the uh, nonprofit groups in town. Uh, uh, I'm a member of the Optimist Club, and we have had about, I think, seven or eight of us volunteering there to help with the traffic, you know, that sort of thing. Yep. It was great. So. And it was cold. It was very, 
it, it felt cold because the, the air is so you damp. Did it earlier? I did it earlier. Oh man! Yeah. <laughs> it just goes right through you. I don't know. But uh, and today we're going to have a recess now and go to uh, Uncle Albert's, one of my favorite cafes in Blue Earth County, mm -hmm. and the public is invited. Also, then we're going to recess and uh, attend our budget presentation and public hearing which uh, kind of took the place of the TNT meeting that we used to always call it. And uh, uh, Bob will be presenting our budget for the uh, 2019 year. Anything to say about that, Bob, for this evening? Uh, same basic meeting that we've had in prior years where we'll present information about the budget and the activity that the county is involved with, so significant changes in our budget and just uh, giving the public an opportunity to comment on our next year's budget. Right. So Make sure you come early to get a good seat. Yep. Yeah. yeah. So you know, come early, it's pretty crowded. I'm leaving my so, stuff here, so I got this. All our department heads will be here, and the county board will be here, and, right? All right, be here quarter to six, I suppose. Yep. Is Trey going to be here? No. Trey. All righty. So move, to, move to recess. We've got a motion for a recess from Commissioner Stromberg. Second. Second from Commissioner Purvis. For a recess then until uh, well, we'll have our little luncheon and then we'll meet tonight at six. Yep.